Shalom, shalom. This is Rabbi Moshe Otero and Bokar Tov. And this morning, a beautiful morning here in South Florida, I want to welcome you to the class. And we are going to continue with our series of Sefer Hai Karim, Rabbi Joseph Albo. Obviously, in the memory of George Albo, Natan, Yehuda Natan, who was a descendant of Rabbi Joseph Albo of Spain, and he about a year ago passed away and so I made a commitment to do a series and hopefully turn this book and edit it uh, to go to publication in his memory and may Hashem help us and may you be part of what we're doing in this project in the series of the Sefer HaIkarim <clears throat> so uh, we finished chapter 16 in our last video and we're going to enter this morning in chapter 17 of the first book of Sefer Karim. Rabbi Abel begins stating in chapter 17 of book 1, every science makes use of the principles and postulates or postulates which are not self-evident, but are assumed as true and borrowed from another science in which they are proved. Upon these principles are built all the proof of science in question. Thus, the geometrician borrows the conception of line and point from the physicist, and the arithmetician borrows from the concept, conception of unity, and the physicist from the conception of substance in accidents from the first philosophy. The first philosophy, in turn, borrows from the physicist the conception of the first mover. So every theoretical science necessarily assumes at the beginning certain principles and postulates which are proved in another science, as is explained in the posterior analytics. Upon these principles, or upon the first principles of axioms, are built all the proofs occurring in that science. This being so, it is proper to inquire whether, <clears throat> where the divine law takes its principles. An inquiry like this is more appropriate in relation to divine law than any other conventional law. And for the principles of conventional law, uh, freedom and purpose, as we said before, are explained by the philosopher in his politics. But where does divine law take its principles? For though the existence of God is proved by the philosophers on the basis of the premise ultimately derived from the first principles or axioms, the philosopher does not believe in prophecy and providence, which are also fundamental principles of divine law. <laughs> Where then are they proved, seeing that they are not self-evident, nor are they proved from the premise of derived from axioms? For the philosophers does not believe in prophecy, and the providence in the manner in which the religionist believes in them. We must therefore explain where the Torah takes its principles. There are four kinds of things which are known without proof. Number one, says Rabbi Albo, the, the first principles or axioms, for example, we know the whole is greater than the part. The things equal to the same things are equal to each other, and that affirmative and the negative cannot be true at the same time in reference to the same thing, in the same relation. Number two, things perceived by the senses. For example, we know that fire makes hot and snow makes cold, that opium makes cold and pepper makes hot. The knowledge we yet get through our senses uh, when we eat pepper, I'm getting a, a scratchy nose for thinking of pepper. We eat pepper, we feel hot, and we taste opium, we feel cold. We judge them that the pepper heats because of the fiery particles in it, and it predominates, and the opium cools because of the cold particles which predominate in it. There are three things that are known by experience. For example, we know that the magnet draws iron, and the scamonium is a purgative because we observe it to be so, not by reason of the quality of the elements which these substances are composed, but by the reason of their specific form. Number four, things known by the continuity of history, and thus we know that Rome and Jerusalem and Babylon were great inhabited cities, though they are no longer. Things known in this way we believe even though we have not perceived them without our senses as if it, we had perceived them. And by reason of the reports which we come from many people, 
in which no one disputes. Every one of these four kinds of presuppositions, or pre I'm sorry, pro of these kinds of propositions may be used as a principle in a demonstration. Just as the proof in geometry, which are all based on, upon axioms, and the demonstrations in physics, which are based on the, upon senses or perceptions, are true without any doubt because they are, their causes are known as, as we see, so the proof which are based upon experience. Though their causes are unknown, it must not be doubted since our senses testifies to their existence. To illustrate, just as we, it can never be that the uh, angles of triangles could be equal the two right angles, or the pepper should not cause heat, as their causes are known and understood. So it can never be that the magnet should not draw iron. Though the cause is not known, it's understood for a thing which experience and testifies cannot be other than it is. The fundamental dogmas and principles of the Torah cannot be apprehended by the way of axioms, nor are they at any time objects of sense perceptions, like the heating of pepper and the cooling of opium, for their cause are unknown. For this reason, God in his wisdom indicated the truth of the principles of Torah by experience, so as to remove all doubt concerning them. For that which is proved true by experience, like the property of the magnet, in attracting iron is not subject to doubt, though it is, though though its cause be unknown. It's the same way as there is no doubt concerning the natural things observed by the senses, which causes are unknown. This is the case in all divine laws. In all divine laws, thus though the law all thus through the law which was given to Adam, he became aware of the existence of God, who spoke to him a prophecy and revelation and reward and punishment. For God revealed himself and spoke to him and gave him a law, as we read. And the Lord God commanded man, saying, The rabbis say that in this, that in this verse, all of the commandments were given to Adam are alluded to. He also verified by experience that there is a retribution for obeying and disobeying the commandments. For he was punished because he violated the commandment of God and allowed himself to be tempted by the serpent through Eve. And the punishment of this world, as we have said, are evidence of the punishment in the world to come. Now Noah too had evidence of prophecy and the existence of God and who spoke to him and realized that there is reward and punishment through the flood. And when he said and his sons were saved, while the others were punished. This is the reason why he received permission to eat flesh, which was prohibited to Adam. Similarly, when Abraham was given the command of circumcision, he became aware of the existence of God who spoke to him, and through the same command, he realized prophecy and revelation. When the Torah was given, all of Israel became convinced of this general principle. When through the prophetic spirit they observed that God was speaking to them and that he gave them a law. The exodus from Egypt proved to them that there is, no, there is providence and reward and punishment. And thus we see that the principle of the Torah were proved beyond a doubt of experience or a doubt by experience. It follows then that the Torah is true and everlasting without a doubt in the same way in a, as in a syllogism. If the premises are true, the conclusion resulting from them is true, without a doubt. The Torah will never change, for the truth is unchangeable. This is the meaning of what it says in the psalmist, The beginning of thy word is truth, and all of thy righteous ordinance endures forever. The meaning is, as the beginning of thy word, the premises which are stated first, in order to derive from them the conclusion. The ordinance is true beyond doubt. The ordinance which comes from them is also true, and hence must endure forever, because the truth never changes. All thy righteous ordinance endureth forever, and therefore the Torah, which is the principles, whose principles are proved by observation of the senses, is true and everlasting, and the tradition proceeding from it is also true without a doubt. Now, to prevent the idea that the principles of the Torah are now known to us by tradition alone, 
Asaph explains in Psalms beginning saying, Give ear, O my people, to my teachings, that some of the principles are known to us by the theoretical speculation, some by continuity of history, and those which no one disputes, and some are purely traditional. This is the meaning of the words in the Psalms. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching, the Torah. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth, and I will utter dark sayings concerning days of old, that which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. That which we have heard alludes to the principles of revelation, which belongs to the category of, his, of the historical. Heard among the, all the nations, which no one can dispute, like the former existence of Egypt and Babylon, which cannot be denied, though we ourselves have not seen the revelations mentioned first, because the author is admonishing us to obey the Torah, to give ear, O my people, to my Torah. The expression which follows and known alludes to the principle of the existence of God and the dogmas der derived from it. These are acquired by theoretical investigations based upon the observations of the senses and the axioms our fathers have told us points to the principles of the spiritual reward and punishment which we know by tradition. To prove this principle, he cites, the miracles and other instances of special providence experienced by our ancestors. As we learn by tradition, these bring, being evidence of the reward in the world to come, as we shall explain in the following chapter 21 of this book number one. And he explains further that the tradition must be continuous from father to son in a chain. And therefore he says he will not hide from their children. He will also make clear the basis that the basis of these principles known to us by tradition was observation by the senses. Then it was handed down to us by a continuous tradition. And this is the meaning of the words. For he established a testimony in Jacob. The meaning is through the testimony of the senses which our ancestors had, God caused the Torah to be handed down in a continuous tradition, continuously by tradition, from father to son, from son that becomes father to son, and so forth and so forth. And here ends chapter 17 of uh, Sefer HaIkarim in the first book of Rabbi Joseph Abba. In our next video, we'll be taking a look at chapter 18, which he delves then into many laws that are called divine, and the devotees of every one of them have a continuous tradition. And the problem arises how to distinguish between the genuine divine law and the spurious ones which claim to pretend to be divine, but are not, or is not. So keep with us, stay tuned as we continue reading and going further into Sefahai Karim, the very fundamentals of Judaism, and to understand the logic behind it as Rabbi Joseph Albo uh, present it to us in his Sefer, Sefer Hai Karim. This is Rabbi Moshe Otero, and remember, be part of the ways of Israel. Be part of growing in knowledge and understanding, and this way, your own emunah will be strengthened and, and further be able to be expressed to others that our God is truly a mighty God, and He reigns not only from heaven above, but here among humankind. Even He is involved in all the worldly affairs of man. This is Rabbi Moshe Otero wishing you and yours a beautiful week. Shalom, shalom.